Thanks, Pablo. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah. Joaquin, it's nice to see you again. Nice to see you Last too. time we saw each other, we were outdoors at, at, a, uh, at another tech event. A uh, little, little smaller crowd than this one. So. <laughs> Glad yeah, to be here. This is wonderful. And I was really excited to, to help moderate here. One of the things that we really love about your story is you spent you know, decades being an operator. And even in, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was in 96, when you were first invited to be a part of uh, the startup that five years later IPO'd, it was a completely different world. Can you tell us a little bit about your start there and yeah. what, you, what you thought about that? Uh, luckily, it didn't IPO five years later. Thank God it, it IPO'd actually a year later. What? Five years would have been 2001, a bad time yeah. to IPO. <laughs> uh, but we'll get to that in this history lesson. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. Uh, so no, yeah, I kind of tripped and fell into a startup uh, right out of college. Uh, older older uh, brother of a friend had called me and said, hey, I'm doing an internet company. You want to come back to Seattle? And I said, I, I don't know what that is, but it sounds better than the roaches in Manhattan, so um, so I came back and did that. So what was the question? Sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> this is going to go great. Yeah. How was it like in 96, being oh. in tech in Seattle? Oh, yeah. You know, and I think there's a question coming about the difference between then and now, and maybe I'll just like, jump, jump to it, because I think the thing you got to realize when at the beginning, and some of us uh, in this room, I know we're there for this, maybe not many, uh, maybe mo some won't admit it, but in the beginning of the commercial internet, um, there was this sense if you were working at a startup, first of all, nobody had ever heard of a startup. There, it wasn't a thing that you did. I mean, if you were smart and motivated, you went to Wall Street or you went to Madison Avenue or you, you know, maybe went into academia or whatever, but you, you probably didn't go work for a startup. So A, Nobody knew what a startup was. B, um, the internet had not been commercialized, nor was it widely accessible. And so those two things made for like this sort of missionary zeal, I think, where if you were working at a startup, probably your parents thought you were crazy and were pissed because they'd paid for you to go to college if you were fortunate enough, um, or they'd watched you go into debt. Um, and either way, they figured you were throwing your life away doing some crazy thing as opposed to just going on to um, become a doctor, a lawyer, or you know, a uh, productive member of the then existing like commercial hierarchy. So everyone felt like a rebel. It, it seems crazy to think that going to a startup is like rebellious because it's really, now it's just another path. But it w you kind of felt like all the odds were against you and you, you were the only person who could see this future that was coming and everyone else was telling you you were nuts. And that's, you know, we worked seven days a week, 14 hours a day for five years, and you did it because you loved the people you worked with, They were, and because you believed that you were onto something that was really special. And I think that can still exist, but I don't see it existing at scale in the same way, because it's just, it's just uh, it was a moment in time. So back then, what was your role exactly? Did you participate in the fundraising? What was that like? So when I... Um, did the third startup, which was the first one that I ended up running, there was an article in the GeekWire, or I believe, or whatever the paper, um, and it said, yeah, the PI, the, PI. <laughs> you, you, the, the, the paper would hit the front door, and, no, um, and it said, uh, uh, former GoToNet executive Kirby Winfield you know, takes on whatever new thing, and someone wrote in the comments, it was online, because I remember someone wrote in the comments, if Kirby Winfield was an executive at GoToNet, I'm an astronaut. <laughs> and, and so I always characterize my experience at my first startup. You know, I ran marketing, um, but I was you know, flying by the seat of my pants. I had like an advertising internship and uh, an, English, <laughs> an English major. And that, those are my qualifications to run marketing for a $4 billion company. Um, I'm shocked that I didn't fail worse than I did, but managed to hire myself a really good boss. Um, learned a lot from, from him, and uh, I think that prepared me for the next thing. Yeah. So eventually, by the late 90s, there became a, a craze around everything.com. Are there any parallels between that and, say, AI right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next question. I mean, I think, I, I think, look, I think we're at a stage of the cycle, much like the late 90s, where the revenue isn't there to support a lot of the valuations. I think the value creation cycle is much longer than people think. 
And I think it's going to take a long time. I mean, people forget that really most of the value created on the commercial internet hadn't even been founded before 2003. I think there are those similarities um, to the negative, perhaps. But I also think, you know, to the positive, this is one of those inflection points where a technology evolves. Because the internet, people forget, the internet was around for a long time before it became commercial. And AI has been around for as long as the internet's been around. But there's an inflection point with these technologies where, um, where they become so cheap and easy to use and accessible that they're able to solve problems that were A, either weren't soluble, solvable, soluble before, or, or B, uh, were just not solvable in such an efficient way. Um, and so you know, there have been a handful of those uh, moments in my you know, short, short career um, that I've seen. This is one of them. So another one of the startups you worked at um, was in 2003, and that was right after the dot-com bust. And how did, how was, that was 20 years ago. Yeah. How was then to now? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 again, like, I think MarchX was the first IPO, tech IPO in this market, for, I want to say, and somebody will correct me, but three years maybe? Yeah. There was, at least two years. It, yeah, at least two years. Um, so the window was shut. People who have talked about 2022 as a, as a, uh, as a, as a crash or a sort of a reset sort of like the dot-com crash tend to forget that the, the recovery from that took about five years. Um, and then when it recovered, it recovered in a big way, briefly. But so I think, I, I honestly think uh, that we're, I, I don't know, um, I'm not like a macroeconomist, I'm an English major, but I, I, I think we're far from having felt the pain. I think there's the, way too much money got pumped into the system and it's not found its way out. And so I think things are actually gonna get worse before they get better which would look a lot like the dot-com era, um, where you know we really started selling in 2000. 2001 was the terror show. But then the wasteland was 2002 and 2003. Um, and things started coming back, right, 2004-ish. So um, yeah, we're probably in for it for a couple more years. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so back then, did you participate in the Company and no, they kept me away from the investors. They, 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 I was, uh, again, much more um, uh, focused on sales marketing, BD. Um, I eventually ran a, a P&L and division of the company as a general manager. But um, no, and you know, for what it's worth, both GoToNet and MarchX, run by an amazing financial engineer named Russ Horowitz, um, who basically spacked both companies before there was such thing as a SPAC in a really smart way, um, used a small business filing with the NASDAQ um, to be able to take, you know, we never raised venture for these deals. I mean, they were friends and family money and, uh, and we were able to take them public and then use the equity to roll up uh, a bunch of other smaller technology companies and build these, these big platform companies. It's more like PE than, than, than venture, um, which is why I <laughs> had to learn so quickly. And, um, had a hard time learning about venture as a startup um, CEO um, my first time um, in 09 and again um, in 13. And I, I think I never really learned, so that's why I became an investor. <laughs> so what inspired you to start being an investor? I believe I was in 16. Um, I just really, I, it's a good question. I didn't want to go and start a company. I wasn't any good at that. Um, and I didn't want to run a company. I struggled with that. And I didn't want to work for anyone because um, I wasn't good at that either. So I was like, well, what's left? <laughs> no, you know, I think I, I'd, I'd stepped in some success and had some, was around some successful people and thought I'd learn from them. I thought that I'd, I uh, might have some good lessons to, to share with uh, entrepreneurs. And, I'd also failed 20 ways to Sunday, you know, um, as a founder and figured I'd want to help people avoid the mistakes that I'd made. And, and I, I always felt like just, honestly, I had to, if there's a way I want to spend my day, it's, it's meeting with really smart, driven, focused people who are working on something that I probably don't have much understanding of or background in. And if, look, I'm going to meet, you know, see, see, see a thousand deals a year and meet with 400 entrepreneurs and invest in 10. But let the, if I can 
learn something from every one of those interactions. Like selfishly, it just trains my algorithm as a human. It makes me like a more interesting person, I think, and it makes my life more interesting. And, um, and so I was like, that's a pretty good way to spend my time. And fortunately, some founders thought it was also a good way for them to spend their time and to spend my money. And so we, uh, so we, uh, we partnered up and um, and had some early uh, some early companies do do well, um, and those experiences went well for I think all parties, and so that that led to raising funds. So going from an angel to a VC, what was that transition, and what is fundamentally different? You can't just invest in people because you like them. That's the, honestly the number one transition to me. Like you just can't do that, um, and that sucks because I really like people and I want everyone to win. And I love seeing people, um, especially people maybe who I wouldn't invest in. I almost want to see them win more in some ways. Um, and so you just can't do that, right? This is, this is uh, I'm the biggest LP in my funds, but I've got a lot of people riding right along with me. And um, we all have a duty to, um, to create the best possible conditions for big returns for the fund. And that means investing in the people you think are going to actually you know, see around corners, build the future, and, and, and create those multi-billion dollar outcomes. And so um, that's, that's the big shift. And I know I'm probably taking way too much time. I'm seeing that I've been here before. I've seen people <laughs> pointing and whispering into their earpieces. No, that's the CIA. Oh, yeah, sorry. That's different. Is there a helicopter up? No. All right. So over time, where do you see the transition in uh, venture or angel investing ecosystem in Seattle? Where do you kind of see it going in the next few years? So. It's a, Seattle's a different place than San Francisco. And I think in a lot of ways that's a really good thing. It's why we you know, invest mostly in Seattle. It's why I'm a big believer in this ecosystem. So I think the ecosystem as a whole is poised to take off. We've got, finally have like the breadth and depth of uh, big tech off ramps that the Valley has always had to allow talented people from Microsoft, Amazon, and other places kind of step down and step down to a place where they are ready to do a startup. Um, and, and by the way, also 40 unicorns in the market where there were none in 2015. And so people know how to build unicorns and build actual companies that sell for 17 billion like Tableau or 32 billion like DocuSign or 6 billion like Auth0. So all that talent and all that stuff, so good for the ecosystem. Angel investing and venture investing in Seattle, like the like majority of the money here is always gonna be from the Bay. That's just the way the, way the capital flows and I don't think that's gonna change. Um, I think it's great to see more big, bigger Series A type firms and more seed firms built here, which we have now with um, a lot of folks in this room and um, certainly most of them raise you know, much bigger funds than me. Um, there might be some more like micro VCs. I don't think Angel changes much here because I just I think it's cultural and I think you know it's not a sport that people want to show off and, and be a part of. And, it's not pe people aren't motivated by the same sort of social capital that they are in the Bay. But that's personal theory, but I just don't, I, I don't I don't see that changing. Um, I hope, and that's okay. Like I think there's enough talent now, enough of that talent creating new funds or partnering with new funds. Um, and by the way, also when I was raising in 2010, I got told point blank by a Silicon Valley investor, "Oh, are you from Seattle? Yeah, they don't work that hard up there, do they?" <laughs> Dead serious. And, and that was the attitude, I think, you know, from a lot of folks. And now that we're stacking up the outcomes, every, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm invested in more deals with, with Valley investors um, than I am with local investors. And I think that's really good for this ecosystem. Um, so I don't know if that answers it, but uh, what a lukewarm way to end a great conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being.